Thanks very much, everyone. It's it's really an honor to be here. I have um, uh, suggested that uh, Bosque and Bioontologies, you know, be closer together for for years, and now we're here actually in person, actually doing it. So it's really it's really an honor to be here for this. Um, so uh, for those that, of you that um, don't know me, you'll, you'll know that in addition to just being a super foodie and loving all things um, hunting, gathering, um, and eating, I, I also am really into cool animals and cars. So this talk is going to be about cool animals and cars more than food, uh, with apologies to Jason. <laughs> um, so first I want to talk about the chasm of semantic despair. And yes, that is me at the bottom of the chasm. Uh, and um, my dear colleague, Dr. Chris Shute coined the term chasm of semantic despair because it really um, sort of reflects the fact that what happens on the basic research side on the left with proteomics data and genomics data, metabolomics data, cellular models, molecular assays, all the wonderful things that are largely going on at this conference really don't talk to um, what's happening on the clinical side for human disease research and care, such as things like even genomic testing, trials data, lab data, um, imaging data um, that we have on the clinical side. And so the answer to crossing this bridge and, and, and overcoming the, the chasm of semantic despair is, of course, um, data and data interoperabilities, ontology is the subject of our talk today, um, tools for managing all of this, standards, and just getting it into the clinic in the, in the, in the, final, in the final last mile. So the sides of, these of this chasm are actually not that different. The clinician, akin to the researcher, collects data about a patient or, a, or, or an organism. Um, they may make documentation. There's clinical coders that code the data, or there's biocurators that curate the data. There's coding systems, ontologies, vocabularies. Some of that data ends up in the EHR on the clinical side or in some scientific database or workflow, as we heard this morning, uh, on the basic research side. And so how do we... How do we actually integrate across these, these different work streams? They're not that different, but yet they're just worlds apart. Um, and semantics are the universal converter. The, hot, the, the answer is semantics. So the problem is that you know, things move differently and at different paces in the clinical world than they do uh, in the basic research world. So in the research community, we have um, uh, ontologies such as those developed by the Monarch Initiative, which I'm going to talk about today, Mondo and HPO. Um, these research ontologies, if you will, are, are proper um, semantically engineered ontologies. Um, they have uh, as you know, up to daily contributions. The, the gene ontology version is available daily. Um, very community focused and community driven by the needs of the community. Um, uh, really evolving quickly to meet um, new and upcoming uh, modern technologies. The same is not true for the clinical world. The, Terminologies are developed largely behind closed doors. They often have closed licenses. They're released annually or biannually. Um, there's not a lot of metadata or attribution or provenance or even definitions associated with them. And there's a long backlog of requests. Furthermore, individual local resources, your local clinical institution um, codes their data um, with local um, coding systems because the whole system is just too slow and they need ways to code their own data. And then they have to reconcile those local coding systems with these very slow gargantuan beasts that are the clinical systems. So the, we have to figure out a way to create interoperability across these two worlds in terms of the semantics. And we need to go at a much greater speed if we're going to actually have the translational mission accomplished to deliver on the promise of precision medicine and really customizing healthcare for each individual person in each individual circumstance. So uh, this ain't no dead piece of metal, a car, rather an ontology, um, is a living, breathing thing and she's alive. <laughs> and yes, I do love my speed racer. Okay. Um, so, uh, and that's, that's the difference. Um, you know, the ontologies that you all, you know, um, contribute to, use, and love are really alive. And, and that's just not true as much on the clinical side. And so how do we sort of bring that sort of mentality together with the clinical environment, but not lose the, the, the reason for that slowness is, and is because of, you know, there's a lot of legal, regulatory, ethical, and just complex engineering issues on the clinical side that just can't 
you know, really deal with the fact that we have these really nimble community driven activities on the, on the sort of more researchy side. And so we need to be able to kind of create that balance. So a lot of what people do is they map things. How many people in the audience have mapped some kind of terminology or ontology? It's, it's probably about 90% or so. Okay. That's a lot of mappings. And they say, map, they say that, you know, one person standard uh, is like, you know, using somebody else's toothbrush. Um, it's even worse for using somebody else's mappings. So, um, and every, yet yeah, everybody does it. Um, so we have source terminologies where people map uh, individual ontologies or terminologies to each other. We have mapping resources such as the Odyssey community has OMOP. Um, we have the UMLS, we have the NCI thesaurus and EBS and many other systems that basically, you know, create sets of mappings between different terminologies. We have coded data locally um, and nationally, and we have uncoded data. And this, these, these data need to be transformed in order to meet certain requirements. So for clinical data, data gets mapped to, say, SNOMED and LOINC is the U.S. core for um, supposed interoperability. But that says nothing about the actual underlying mapping standards or rule sets that are used to create those mappings. And it's even worse if we're talking about free text, which we'll come back to a little bit later in the talk. And then finally, we have code sets, which are really sets of things that are mapped to each other. So for example, if you want to say, here is the definition of diabetes in electronic health record, you'll, you'll be surprised if you're not a clinical person to note that it is not one term from an ontology or a terminology. It's actually a collection of terms as we want to be, make sure we're collecting all the different flavors. And those code sets are essentially computable phenotypes or sets of rules that say, okay, here's the patients that have diabetes. Um, it's not so easy to just do a simple query for one URI. So mapping is all over the place. It's lossy. It lacks provenance. What are we going to do about this? So um, uh, on with the um, uh, car analogies. Um, the first example, set of examples I'm going to talk about are from anatomy. And I have to say today I'm really excited to talk about some really old work that's really kind of come into some new light recently. And I'm not going to talk about COVID, which is what I've spent the last two years um, working on. So that's also very exciting for me. Um, so uh, back in the day, uh, we had a lot of different anatomy ontologies. So each organismal community put together their own anatomy ontologies for their organism or their taxon. And we have um, uh, Hilmar Lapp in the audience who has worked with me on a lot of this uh, for many years in the Phenoscape project, for any of you who, who have seen his talk. Um, and so, you know, what are we going to do about the fact that we have all these different anatomy ontologies and everybody's mapping to each other? Can we just, can we just create cross-references? Is the lung in a mouse the same as the lung in a human? Um, does the lung develop in the same way in the human as it does in the mouse? And the, and the list goes on. It gets really complicated when, you know, you realize that the body parts really don't all align quite perfectly across all the organisms. And when we try to automate this, it doesn't really work so well. So this is, these are actually real mappings that exist. I'm not going to um, point fingers at the resource I got them from, but, um, you know, we have things like the human from the foundational model of anatomy extensor um, uh, ret retinaculum of the wrist is mapped to, to the mouse retina. Okay, those are obviously very different terms, and yet the NLP processor mapped these two terms, so it's not useful. Um, at the bottom, my favorite um, bad mapping example is the um, human colon is mapped to the city of Cologne uh, in Panama. Okay, so you can't just use these mappings out of the box. Remember the part about the toothbrush. Okay, so uh, what do a craniofacial surgeon and a dinosaur biologist have in common? <laughs> Anybody want to take a guess? Um, yeah. What, did, what was that? Teeth? Stuff with teeth. Yes, exactly. And teeth come in part, part of the tooth, not all of it, uh, from the neural crest. So you are correct. Um, so we, part of this engineering experiment of getting all these different anatomy communities to work together is to bring people like these together in a room and duke it out. What do we mean by craniofacial anatomy? What tissues exist? Well, how do they develop? Is it the same in this taxon as it is in that taxon? How do we cre create a generalizable structure that generalizes across all organisms that have neural crest or craniofacial features? And how do we create extensions for the specific taxa or organisms that have unique um, you know, uh, characterizations in addition to that? 
And so, so, so we actually, in real life, got a craniofacial surgeon together with a very famous dinosaur biologist and figured this all out. And now the result is a much more robust uh, representation of craniofacial anatomy because it comes from these different um, perspectives. And also, it was fun. Um, so this is the story of Uberon. Um, and so when we started this work, uh, we had, this is just shown on the left, um, Uberon, which is in blue. We were just starting to kind of create Uberon at the time. This is back in about, what, 2006. Um, and you can see all the different cross-references between the different ontologies, the amphibian anatomy ontology, the teleost anatomy ontology, the vertebrate skeletal anatomy ontology, and there are many more. And you can see that, that they all were kind of cross-referencing each other. And so by bringing all of these communities together, we were able to create a much more easily maintainable and interoperable shared solution that was Uberon. Um, and over on the right, you can see just kind of how that progressed over time. So the yellow bar is Uberon's size and the number of classes in the ontology. And over time as it grew, we started sort of subsuming, but subsuming in a, in a kind partnership way, um, these other resources to make sure that their needs were not only met, but their needs were exceeded by having a shared solution. And I'm going to show you on the next slide kind of how that actually that solution has actually you know come to pass um, and the impact that it's had of going through this. I will also mention that you'll see it started in 2006, um, and when I wrote this paper, it was 2014. The, the um, Uberon has continued to, to grow and largely without funding, largely just based on the volunteerism of all this incredible community that came together to create this shared resource. Um, so it, it's worth the investment, but it does take uh, a lot of time. And also, I should also mention that, you know, most people who say they need a new ontology usually don't. They just don't know how to enhance or extend or um, reimagine what already exists. And so... Um, think really hard uh, if you decide to make a new ontology, because making a new ontology can mean, you know, a decade of work for someone like our folks, like our group, um, if it's not thoughtful. So this is um, uh, Uberon. At, you can read more about it at uberon.org. Um, and what you'll see here uh, in the middle is just a species neutral representation of things such as the swim bladder and its relationship to um, res respiration organ, to organ, to um, uh, and then you can see um, ho uh, homology relationships, part relationships, developmental relationships. Um, we have um, relationships across all the species. We have taxon constraints. And so what we can do with this is we can create um, exports or views of this, you know, kind of gargantuan kind of collection of, of anatomy for each individual use case. So if you need a brain ontology for mammals, we can create that. If you need a, you know, teleost anatomy ontology, we can create that um, because of the, the nature of the logical definitions that are there and the communities that continue to contribute their specific content with the right um, domain constraints um, uh, that are uh, encoded in the ontology. And so it turns out to be an enormously more sustainable mechanism to maintain interoperability, to maintain a good development environment. Um, a lot of the um, you know, kind of smaller communities just didn't know how to build ontologies. And now they have this framework where they can contribute their expert knowledge in a really easy way. Um, and then they get back out um, what they need uh, even more in spades because now they can create links and, and do analytics across species or across domains. Um, the other thing that's really been really interesting in a sort of social sense is just how it's helped to standardize and align other standards and ontologies. Um, and this is just a graph um, uh, from the fair sharing um, platform, looking at the use of Uberon in other standards. And it's not even gotten them all that we know of anyway. Um, but you know, if you think about the, the entirety of the underlying anatomy that's represented in the gene ontology is based on Uberon. So we have standardized not just anatomy, but we've standardized anatomical processes and anatomical um, subcellular components and anatomical um, you know, uh, activities based upon um, these, the partnership between Uberon and, and Go. And the same thing is true for the human phenotype ontology and many of uh, your other uh, favorite ontologies is that wherever anatomy is present, we'll just use this one now that's community contributed and validated over a decade. Okay, so um, uh, the second uh, set of examples uh, is focused on disease. And um, I was hard pressed to come up with a good car for disease. So we have here the Tickmobile. Uh, and the Tickmobile is a public health service mobile that goes around and helps people learn about Lyme's disease. 
and it's cute. Okay, so harmonizing terminologies across sources. So for the work that we do in the Monarch Initiative, which largely focuses on rare disease diagnostics and data integration for mechanism discovery, we really needed a way to reconcile all the different disease terminologies and, and resources that exist. How do we collate the world's rare disease knowledge into one artifact that we can then use for all of our computations? Well, it turns out that uh, many different disease resources exist, hundreds if not, uh, you know, uh, hundreds of them in fact. So complex diseases, cancer, infectious diseases, rare diseases, um, there's really no shortage of disease terminologies and knowledge sources. Um, and many of them map across each other. Um, the problem is though that they're often mutually inconsistent and that there are n squared sets of mappings and most of them are not one-to-one -one equivalents. So how do we disentangle this mess and create one sort of unified mechanism to, to have a representation of disease that can be used for our, our diagnostic tools and our mechanism discovery tools. And the problem is, is that like, depending on where you live in the world, if you're trying to get a rare disease diagnosis and they're only using one or two of the source resources, you have much less chance of getting a diagnosis than if we could collate and work together similar to what we did for Uberon, the world's rare disease knowledge. And it's not just rare diseases, it's Mendelian diseases, infectious diseases, cancer, et cetera. So here's an example. So, um, so here we have um, peroxisome biogenesis disorder. Um, we have Zellweger syndrome and we have say um, peroxisomal disease. And those labels are not aligned. Um, we could do the NLP thing, but I've already shown you, I think pretty well that that doesn't always work so well. Um, and it turns out these different um, kind of subgraphs here have different labels for the terms. They have different parents, they have different children, they have different uh, synonyms and they have different text definitions. How do we know um, if they're equivalent? And so basically um, what I'm gonna show you now is sort of the process for creating a, a kind of common ontology, which is really quite different than what we did uh, for Uberon. Um, and I also wanna thank the ClinGen uh, Peroxisomal Biogenesis Expert Group, which really sort of um, uh, with Nicole Vasilevsky um, helped uh, vet the outcomes of our algorithms and our curation to make sure that it was scientifically correct. So, um, so I'd like to introduce Mondo, which means for the world and it's by the world. Really, it's an international effort to create this disease consensus ontology. Um, it has many, many different disease terminology uh, inputs, such as Orphanet, NCIT, GARD, EFO, DO, OMIM, MESH, and, and others, um, with an algorithm that uh, Chris Mungle developed called KBOOM, uh, which is the Bayesian Owl Ontology Merging Algorithm, uh, recently reinstated uh, by uh, Jim Balhoff as Boomer. Uh, so for those of you who are looking for the more recent code, um, <laughs> Um, and it's really amazing. It basically um, kind of looks for the most parsimonious equivalence cliques across all these different terminologies and then spits out a probability score of equivalence that um, curators can go through and say, yeah, we understand what happened. And when we were first building, Uber, uh, first building Mondo, um, it was really interesting. We found, for example, a whole branch of mesh that was duplicated because there was um, a branch of diseases that had alphanumeric so diabetes type one with a number one and Roman numerals, diabetes type one with a Roman numeral one, all completely duplicated and they had no idea that this had existed. And so we were able to give that feedback back to um, the NLM and they were able to fix it and merge those concepts. So, so the algorithm worked really well to find um, issues like that and kind of clean things up. And then, so basically, that it, we, but we keep all the provenance of those decisions and all the provenance of all those identifiers, all the versioning um, in the, in the, in the mo central Mondo resource so that you can always go back, you can always um, see where the information came from and you can make decisions about what information you might like to use in your application or your software tools. So this is an example of what that looks like. And this is a concept uh, for adult refsum disease. Um, so it has an Mondo identifier. And if you look at the um, color boxes in the middle, you can see the sources that go into defining uh, adult refsum disease, um, and there are many of them. And they each have um, uh, synonyms that have different labels coming from different sources. And so that provenance is tracked in Mondo as well. Um, and these are all equivalent, okay? So this has been just gone through this process, has been curated and maintained by experts as equivalent. But what you also see is over on the right, there are a variety of, of just a few examples here. There are many others that kind of show sort of broader or narrower synonyms, broader or narrower cross-references, cross-references that are downright wrong, 
Um, and so we want to we want to be able to capture that information, but we don't want to be able to use it as if it were equivalent. And so if you just took labels or cross references, again the toothbrush out of the box, you would not be classifying a patient for a diagnosis correctly with adult rest some disease based upon these problems. So this is really crossing that translational bridge again, right? How do we um, how do we get this into the clinic so that um, that the patient has the best possible opportunity for a diagnosis means that we, we, don't, have the, we don't have the luxury of having bad mappings. Um, so you're welcome to go um, check out Mondo, Mondo at mondo.monarchinitiative.org. Um, it's also in OLS and all your other favorite ontology places. Um, and this is just a quick example of showing, um, you know, the hierarchy and the relationship uh, between that, that same example. And you can kind of see um, all the different identifiers that have been collated for each term, their relation, their subtype relationship, um, their, um, their major features. So also relating um, the human phenotype ontology or other phenotype ontologies. We also work on veterinary uh, diseases within Mondo. Um, uh, you know, creating those kind of associations, we now have a way of classifying diseases based upon the attributes of the disease. So this leads to the final side of this, this um, race, which is basically, okay, now that we've done all of this, and, and this was started, you know, about four or five years ago, how do we, um, how do we know, like, how many rare diseases are actually are there now that we've reconciled all these knowledge sources? In 1983, the Orphan Drug Act claimed that there were 7,500 rare diseases, and that number is still quoted to this day in many, many places, including uh, our government websites, rare disease websites. Um, so we looked at just five sources in this analysis, um, which we, where we found over 10,000 unique rare disease concepts. What's really interesting more than that, and that's not surprising, of course we know a lot more rare diseases than we did in 1983. Um, I would like it if those resources would update their numbers. <laughs> but is it that many diseases are only in one source. So if we hadn't gone through the process of this, again, coming back to that goal of Mondo being for the world, we, we need to reconcile the, the world's rare disease knowledge so that every rare disease patient can be counted uh, so, and they can only be counted if we actually can count the actual rare diseases themselves. And so um, when we look, uh, only 333 of the concepts in that 10,577 um, were actually in all five of these sources. That's very few. Um, and so you can look at uh, this lovely upset plot to see all the different overlaps. Um, and of course, many do overlap quite a bit. But the point is, is that um, they overlap, but they also um, are inconsistent in all the ways that I just explained. So cleaning up all this mess has been, you know, a, a, just a, an enormous community effort um, from many countries and many organizations. Uh, so, in, and it's a great testament to team science and open science. Um, there is a um, GitHub tracker. There are um, uh, weekly curation meetings. There's monthly community meetings. There's a user listserv. Anybody's interested, talk to Nicole. Can wait for him. Oops, oops. Okay, so. Um, now we're on to uh, phenotyping. So, <laughs> so I don't know what, how we would describe the phenotype of this car, but it has many features. <laughs> um, okay, so phenotyping in 2022 is not so different than it was in 1907. So these are some notes from 1907. Um, and that's, again, this kind of really speaks to that sort of slowness of, of how, you know, even though we have electronic health records now, they're really just electronic forms of what we used to write down in a notebook uh, back in the day. So we need to figure out, again, how do we turn information into meaning? And the problem is, is that in the clinical side, we're mostly over here on the left. Um, we have lists of things, problem lists, drug lists. Um, we have um, simple taxonomy such as ICD, which has really changed uh, you know, the world in terms of standards for representing clinical data, but it's a flat taxonomy with no definitions, no provenance, no attribution, and no evidence. And so coding systems and coders you know, have to make up these things um, individually. And that sort of leads to, again, inconsistencies even over time in one institution and certainly across institutions. We really need to be representing um, disease and clinical knowledge as a graph because we want to be able to classify things, you know, um, like breast cancer as a disease of the breast as well as the thoracic region. And if we don't know that the breast is part of the thoracic region, we're not region, we're not going to be looking for the same kinds of things clinically or in imaging or diagnostics. So lots and lots of things have many different um, uh, multiple classification needs, and most clinical systems don't leverage um, that feature at all. 
So um, we've heard a little bit about the human phenotype already at this conference. Um, for those of you who are less familiar, it's a it's a um, class of, it's a multi, it's a, a proper ontology with over fourteen thousand terms um, that represent all areas of phenotypic features, such as our Mad Max car. Um, there are um, uh, what's really great and it's similar to what I mentioned about Uberon in the gene ontology is that the underlying axioms for the representation of the terms in the human phenotype ontology are represented in terms of uh, um, annotations coming from other species and other, uh, other ontologies. So for example, hyposmia um, is represented uh, in terms of an abnormality or absence of sensory perception of smell from the gene ontology which at the time I, I did this query had over 34,000 annotations and 22 species. There's no clinical terminology that has that kind of interoperability with other data. That's a huge opportunity for mechanism discovery, for treatment development, um, and for diagnostics. Um, and so uh, the human phenotype is widely adopted in many different rare disease and, and clinical applications now. So it's really the first proper ontology that's used for sort of mechanistic uh, biology in the clinical realm. So I wanted to show you a little bit how it works um, for diagnostics. So um, in the Monarch Initiative, we have created um, curated gold standard reference diseases uh, that are what we call a phenotypic profile. So in the middle in blue, we have one of those for Weidemann Steiner syndrome. And that has terms such as short toe, um, uh, microcephaly, short stature, hypertelorism. And when a patient comes in, such as the three-year-old girl on the left and the 14-year-old boy on the right, the clinician cap captures the phenotypic features of each of their patients and then runs an algorithm that does semantic similarity against our gold standard set of, of, of um, profiles. Um, and in this case, both of these patients were uh, diagnosed with Weidermann-Steiner sy syndrome, had, a, had um, the same disease in the same gene, but also had different variants in that gene, KMT2A. And so it also sort of begs the question of what defines a disease. Is this Weidermann-Steiner syndrome uh, type 1 and type 2, um, and that is in fact the subject of uh, enormous discussion uh, with ClinGen and OMIM and many other organizations that are participating in, in Mondo. But, but for the, the point is, is that the um, algorithm can allow the sort of fuzzy comparison of non-exact matching sets of profiles based upon semantic similarity algorithms. But for this to work, we need uh, reference knowledge for each disease to be systematically query queryable. And um, we're going to come back to this when we get to the finish line. All right. So um, patients and families should also be empowered to work as partners in this process. So it turns out that patients have knowledge about their diseases that clinicians don't. Probably comes as no surprise to any of you. If you have an inconsolable baby or a baby that doesn't cry, that might not be observed in the clinic, right? Or if you snore, like these are not, not everything that, you know, goes on in your body or in your life is observable in those very brief moments that we spend in the clinic. And so we really need patients to be helping self-phenotype and contributing to this process of diagnostics. Um, also just, you know, provider time constraints, care fragmentation, um, knowledge democratization, um, Patients really like participating in their own diagnostic odyssey. They don't want to just be the subject of some clinician in their 10-minute stints. They want to actually be active participants, especially ones that have very long diagnostic odysseys uh, and, a, and a potential rare disease. So um, uh, we, we basically translated the human phenotype ontology into many languages, actually, and that's another a subject for another day about um, how to manage language translations and ontologies. But in this case, we translated it into layperson ease. Um, so we have things like micronathia um, translated into small jaw or arachnodactyly into spider fingers. And so these are terms that patients can understand. And by flipping, um, you know, ontology labels, so there's a subset label on these terms that says, you know, layperson, we can create displays in, in um, phone apps and in online tools that can then show patients things that are a little bit more familiar uh, to them. Um, so we also wanted to know, uh, so how, given that we've done, translated the H per, HPO into laypersonese, not all of the ontology was translatable. There's lots of clinical terms that just don't have any layperson term. So only about a third of the terms were really layperson translatable. And so we want to understand, you know, how diagnostically useful would it be for just a patient alone to self-phenotype and then go under that, you know, um, use the algorithm for doing that uh, semantic similarity comparison. So how many terms can we take away um, from a patient's profile and still be able to match to that Weidemann-Steiner syndrome in the middle? 
Um, and so we did an experiment. This is just about to be um, uh, submitted for publication where um, in this example, we have nephroblastoma where we, we took um, simulated profiles over on the left for all, using all the layperson synonyms that were available and where one wasn't available, we went up. Um, and then on the right, we compared it to a commonly used uh, survey instrument that had been mapped to HPO that had about 200 terms. Um, and you can see here the example of those um, synonym matches um, that some of them are perfect matches, some of them are fuzzy matches, and some of them have, have no matches, depending if you're looking at the layperson uh, third of the HPO or the 200 terms from, uh, from the Genome Connect uh, survey. And so um, that kind of shown over there on the left, the Genome Connect survey has um, only 200 terms. The HPO layperson is about a third of the ontology, and this is the full clinical ontology. And so what we, what we were able to do is to do the semantic similarity for all of our profiles. For every single um, disease uh, um, profile that we had, we would generate um, a simulated profile based upon those, that rule set. If it, has a synon if it has a layperson term, use that term. If it doesn't go up, we also added noise, subtracted things, played around with just different ways of making it messy. You know, a patient comes in, um, they, you know, happen to have, you know, um, a rare disease, but they also had a headache that day. And so they record that and that's kind of noise, that sort of thing. And what we found was actually, and using multiple different algorithms, that um, the number of diseases correctly ranked um, here by the layperson slim in the top five hits was substantially better than we might've expected given that only a third of the ontology was actually available for layperson use, right? So if this is the gold standard matching comparison, these are the lay simulated profiles and this is the survey instrument. So it definitely tells us that patients should absolutely be contributing terms, especially knowing that some of them might even be complementary um, to the ones that are clinically observed. So this is very exciting and we're now just getting started on building better tools for patients to be able to do this. Okay, so now on to um, model organisms. Um, I promised organisms. Um, so uh, at the time we did this analysis, there were 19,201 human coding genes with 4,092 of them having causal variations associated with disease. So that's 20% of the human coding genome. On the right, um, when we take the orthologs, um, and you can argue in this audience about which methods to use for ortholog assignment, we won't go there today. Um, but uh, suffice it to say that, um, that uh, of those orthologs in the five most commonly used model organisms, uh, um, C. elegans, fruit fly, zebrafish, the mouse, and yeast, um, 16,000 of those orthologs had causal variations associated with phenotypic outcomes that have been documented. And if you take the union of these, we have 84% coverage of the human coding genome. Okay, so now there's a whole lot of data about genotype phenotype correlations available from just these five other model organisms. How do we actually use that data though, right? How do we create interoperability between you know, a mouse or a yeast uh, and, and the human clinical uh, environment that I just talked about. So um, we developed a process that, you know, basically leveraged a species neutral entity quality logic pattern. So for that human uh, phenotype ontology term would be like hypolysinemia over here on the left. Um, that would be sort of lysine that's part of the blood. It's kind of a post-composition term and, when, and has a quality associated with it, decreased amount. Um, and by doing the same approach in all the organisms, here are the mouse, we can, say, we can understand that decreased circulating lysine levels in the mouse are essentially analogous to hypolysinemia in the human because their um, EQ statements for the underlying logic um, across those different species using species neutral ontologies like Uberon or the cell ontology or others, um, you know, help us classify that. And it doesn't need to be exact, it just needs to be ontologically classifiable and satisfiable. Okay, so um, moving on, and I'll come back to that point in, in, in a minute about the cross-species part when we put things all together, but I wanted to um, take a little detour and talk about the mapping uh, rules of the road. So curation rules, provenance, evidence, versioning, and attribution for mapping. How can we all do better? How can all of this community work, work, work better together to make it so that every time you use somebody else's mappings, you can actually really reuse them and it's not like using somebody's toothbrush. So here's an example of just some of the range of mapping types across some of the ontologies. So um, one of the diseases we work a lot on is Fanconi anemia, and you can see here there are different types, Fanconi anemia A, Fanconi anemia B, 
um, in the middle from OMIM. There's also Fanconi anemia in the guard resource, and there's a, a broad to narrow um, a mapping there. There's a mapping to Fanconi syndrome, which is actually um, a renal disease, has nothing to do with Fanconi anemia. That would just be plain wrong, um, similar to the city of Cologne. Um, and we have a lot of um, other kinds of associations as well. We have subclasses, we have uh, mappings to genes, uh, we have mappings to proteins, and we need to figure out you know, how to make sense of all the different types of mappings and what they actually mean, where they came from, what the evidence is, what the provenance is, what the versions were. Um, and so towards that end, um, the community has created um, what we call now SESM. I like to refer to it as the Slytherin standard because I could never say S-S-S-O-M correctly fast enough. Um, so you can call it what you like, SESM or Slytherin. Um, and in this mapping, it's a very, very simple model to capture just the key elements of what um, ontology mappings we have. So we have a subject predic predicate object. Um, we have labels, we have IDs for everything, of course. Um, we have the match field label. So like, what do we wanna call that? We have mapping date, we have confidence scores, we have the match type, is it human curated, is it automated? If it was automated, what tool was used? What version of that tool was used? We have reviewer IDs with attribution to ORCID. Um, and we and uh, shown at the bottom is the is the mapping tool, um, and then here is an example. And there's a, this paper just came out, so if you're if you've not seen it, please take a look if you're in the business of mapping. Um, and then um, this is just to show you a, a little bit more about sort of what the file looks like. So there's a header that has some metadata about um, you know about uh, about the source of the mappings. Um, and then what registered queries are there, and then the, the full set of mappings. And one of the things that we've been working on and we'll be working on in new versions and would welcome contributions, this might be especially interesting in the context of discussion this morning on the workflows, um, is, is what are the sort of curation rules that apply at the full file level versus what apply at the row level? So if I want to say, I'm only gonna include human curated mappings, or I'm only gonna use mappings I'm only going to create mappings that have an exact match. Um, how is that determined? That would apply to the whole file versus individual rows where I might want to say, you know, this was a mapping that was validated, you know, by Nicole, um, for example. So we, we have, have to have the ability to say what the curation rules are at those two different levels. Um, uh, and then um, trying to understand also um, how, you know, how to um, sort of implement uh, um, SSSOM into other standards, for example, um, the HL7 Fast Healthcare Interoperability Standard, which also leverages a lot of mappings, or the OMOP standard, which also maps a lot of things, as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, how do we, so we've been working with both of those communities to um, sort of, you know, help them provide better evidence, provenance, and just documentation of the mappings that are used so that we can bring some of this rigor from our basic research um, semantics community into that clinical environment. Okay, so onto the finish line. So ontologies to turbocharge knowledge integration. Um, and yes, for any, any of you in the room, we're here because you, um, you either develop, use, or love ontologies. And so your ontology is part of the future. Um, and so hopefully this will inspire you to think about how some of the things I've talked about today um, can help you in the science that, that you wanna achieve, um, not only for yourself or your group, but also for the community uh, writ large. So integration across different resources, I mean, data sources, knowledge sources, requires solving this mapping problem. And I've talked about ontology mapping, but I wanna talk a little bit about the difference between ontology mapping and schema mapping. Um, so we have, um, you know, on the right, uh, well, actually, so on the left, um, we have two different, you know, um, uh, artificial data models shown there. And you can see that there's some similarities. Some have some of the same color boxes, some have some of the same relationships, but there's each source really models data differently. Um, there's no direct, for example, there's no direct link in one model between sample and diagnosis. Um, and we would need to remodel sample to, Kate, to a patient case and diagnosis to a case to align with sample to diagnosis, right? And so this is the kind of schema mapping issues that, that you know, kind of arise. And then within each of those fields there, we have different value sets or enumerations. And they can often come from terminologies or ontologies, but they can also be um, just lists of things. Um, and so we need to uh, figure out how to align those as well. And that also helps us with the schema mapping, because if there's a lot of consensus across the value sets, well, that sort of might be a, 
evidence that those schema um, components are actually uh, equivalent, right? Uh, and if they're very different, that might be an indication that they're not or that something is otherwise um, kind of bonkers. So, so for example, one, um, one resource might encode race as not reported, white, American Indian or Alaskan Native, or Black or African American, while another might have a list that looks like not allowed to collect, unknown, white, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, other Black or African American. Now, when we're combining data that has these value sets from these different sources, how do we map things like, you know, other or unknown to not reported? Is that a good mapping? It, it might or it might not be given the context, right? And the point is, is that it doesn't really matter if it's good or not in general. It matters if it's good or not for your context and that you've actually documented why it's good or not for that context and that it's, you know, reproducible and that you can um, know the meaning of the data once it actually has been integrated. So another example is, um, and this is really the subject of our work in the Monarch Initiative, is that different communities annotate different relationships between things at different levels of granularity and using different vocabulary. So um, if we think about like ClinVar creates disease to variant associations, um, the NCI creates disease to gene associations as does uh, OMIM, you know, our work on the human phenotype ontology in Monarch creates disease to phenotype associations. We have resources like um, uh, ClinGen uh, um, that create disease to treatment associations and resources like um, the um, toxicogenomics database that create um, a disease to environment associations. And then they all overlap in some of those things, right? And so really when you take all these different resources together and you wanna create a full representation of the attributes of a disease, there's a schema that's, that's implied here, right? But none of these organizations are using a common schema. Some of them aren't even using a schema at all. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so um, in comes uh, LinkML, and I, I know we have a, a few enthusiasts in the, in the, in the audience, um, so definitely I'm happy to discuss later as well. So this is a, really came about because of this challenge of like, you know, we have, we have things like JSON and JSON-LD for, for kind of trying to align schemas um, and content, but we don't really have a good way of sort of creating the robustness that we need to associate the ontologies and the semantic um, encodings into those schema in a, in a consistent way. And so LinkML is a metadata model for structuring data. It allows you to create data models using simple YAML files, um, which you can optionally annotate using ontologies, not a requirement. Um, but it also is really good because it's, it's great for you know, data scientists and expert computer scientists uh, and bioinformaticians, but it's also super easy for anyone a bio curator without a lot of coding expertise to create a data model that makes sense and is e easily understandable and creates automatically generated documentation that anybody can understand. And then you can compile it to all kinds of different frameworks, whatever you might need. Um, so now we have this interoperability layer for whether you need it in OWL or you want it in JSON-LD or you need some Python data classes or you just simply want a TSV file at the other end. Um, you, it, you can compile it and, and generate all these different artifacts. Um, and then you can, um, uh, put those uh, artifacts into the right tools for the right job with no, not locking yourself into anything based upon your schema having to you know, be so tightly coordinated with whatever those applications are, whether it's a semantic web application, whether it's validators or data entry applications. Um, you can just, um, it's much easier to sort of, um, you know, kind of evolve these things over time as new technologies come and go uh, for our various platforms and applications we don't have to sort of, you know, reinvent our schema every single time. Um, and so uh, um, the other thing here is I just kind of want to come back to that enumerations problem with the race example. Um, it also supports these ontology bindings for value sets and value set mappings. We're working really hard right now on basically building into LinkML something that looks a lot like um, the, the SESOM, the, the SSOM Slytherin standard, to... Um, you know, to basically provide schema mapping um, uh, within the context of the LinkML stack, but also uh, ontology bindings for these value sets in a systematic way so that you can map more easily across value sets. I mean, this is the subject of, you know, much consternation in clinical research where we have things called common data elements or CDEs, which are largely large sets of these value sets that um, aren't really coded very well and are really hard to map with full provenance. So we think that the combination of 
um, SESM for the ontologies themselves, mappings, and LinkML with its um, encoding of value sets and the mapping across the schemas and the value sets will complete that picture. So here's an example of a LinkML model called BioLink. It was the first one that really started the whole LinkML thing. Um, and we created it to help support knowledge integration for the Monarch Initiative, as well as for the um, NCATS data translator, which is a big knowledge graph integration project. Um, so this is a link, the LinkML data model represents biological and biomedical knowledge. It bridges multiple vocabularies and ontologies. It's agnostic as to the graph formalism that might be used to represent knowledge. I mean, it consists of entities, associations, predicates, and properties. It's pretty simple. Um, it's a common dialect for representing knowledge, and it can bridge across things like Neo4j and RDF graphs. And it can also map existing models um, uh, into the BioLink model. One of the things that we've really focused a lot on the BioLink model is evidence, providence, context, and competence um, of the relationships that are present in the knowledge graph that it represents. And so the end result here um, is the Monarch uh, knowledge graph. And for those of you who were around yesterday who were doing some uh, you know, interesting things with rare disease, um, you know, network biology, um, this is for you. Um, and so essentially we've created, we've taken all these different data sources and dip from different um, contexts, such as the, the figure I showed you before, um, and, you know, uh, encoded them or transformed them using those on using all the ontologies that are listed here. Um, so there's a lot of ontologies, there's a lot of data sources, and basically um, using Mondo, um, Ufino, which was the um, ontology for the cross-species work, um, uh, Uberon, um, and other ontologies, we can bring all of these different data sources together into one giant knowledge graph, where we now have um, 831,000 genotype phenotype, uh, gene to phenotype associations, and over 9,000 causal gene to disease associations, and 25,000 non-causal gene to disease associations. So the API is publicly available, and there's lots and lots of different kinds of reports that are really helpful to understand the data. Um, at these two links. So uh, just to conclude, um, towards an open data highway, uh, semantics can help uh, cross the chasm of semantic despair and help us cross that translation, translational divide. Um, when I was a graduate student here in Madison, um, I used to think about my research as being um, faith-based research because I had to believe that the bench science I was doing would be um, useful to human health um, uh, contexts. Um, and I think that um, while that's still true for a lot of basic researchers that kind of feel like, how do I make my research, you know, really useful mechanistically to the clinical endeavor and how do we actually improve human lives? I think semantics are part of the solution for that. And, and you all here in the room are part of that solution too. Um, another point is that available data does not mean reusable data. Um, just because it's available doesn't mean it's licensed for reuse, doesn't mean that it's interoperable, doesn't mean that the schemas or the ontologies that are used are there. And a lot of work has to go into, and a lot of expertise as well, has to go into making data fundamentally reusable. Creating, you know, things like Uberon or the Monarch Knowledge Graph took many, many years and many, many people hours um, because the resources that are generating that knowledge aren't designing it for reusability. So as you generate new things, um, think about what would you do uh, if you were yourself five years down the road when you were trying to reuse that resource and help contribute to some of these um, artifacts like um, the SSSOM standard to sort of help, help the next person uh, be able to make the, the expert content that you're developing in one way or another uh, more reusable by the rest of the community. Um, fundamentally, we need to align schemas and ontologies and terminologies. One or the other doesn't cut it. They have to be done in concert. Um, we need fully provenance and evidence-based mappings to integrate data that meets quality standards. If we're ever going like, to get to that point in the clinical endeavor where we need to have that robust quality assurance in order to meet regulatory guidelines, ethical guidelines, legal guidelines for use in the clinic, we have to have everything be fully provenance and evidence-based. It's the only path for getting our basic research and our semantic engineering content into the clinic. And then finally, um, good socio-technical engineering, um, which in my mind are occasions like getting that um, you know, famous dinosaur biologist who's on the you know, cover of Nat Geo together with you know, um, a, a craniofacial surgeon is not only you know, super fun, but it's also you know, really um, how, how we can really bring expert knowledge together 
um, and the technologies that encode that knowledge uh, together so that everybody can benefit from a shared representation. Um, I want to end by um, thanking everybody, in particular um, my co-conspirators Peter Robinson and Chris Mungle, who have partnered with me for over a decade on the Monarch Initiative, the Human Phenotype Ontology. Uh, more recently, um, uh, uh, on Mondo, and Nicole is the lead curator for Mondo, so if you have questions about Mondo. Um, also, uh, Nico, who has uh, um, really led the effort on uh, the SESM uh, Simple uh, Ontology Standard. Um, we have Moni here in the audience, who uh, is our program director for Monarch and really sort of coordinates all of the complex moving pieces. Um, and then also Tim Putman, um, in particular, who uh, has re-engineered all of our ETL pipelines to meet these new standards as they've as they've come about, um, and that's all available on GitHub as well. So, um, and then many thanks to all of our data partners. We are the quintessential uh, research data parasites. Um, without all the data sources that we leverage, we would not be able to build our diagnostic tools or our mechanism discovery tools, um, and then also our funding from uh, NIH. So, um, ontologies for the win, and I hope that you all um, use cars or cool animals in your next talk. So thanks very much. Hi, great talk. Um, it's clear that we have to move from human phenotype ontology to monarch um, ontology using all, all kinds of ontologies. I see that you're applying this to sick kids and NGL1. Or, um, how, do you, how do you take um, the phenotype to gene associations from humans to model organisms and how do you weight them when you're seeing patients? Um, so I think your question, I'm just gonna try to repeat the question. You're a little bit hard to hear. I'm not sure if it's the, if it's the mic, the mask or some combination. So um, let me see if I get it right. Um, so I think you asked that you're, if, when we're presenting um, sort of gene phenotype associations to clinicians, how are, we, how are we thinking about doing that? And how are we taking this heterogeneous information and you know, coalescing it to help deliver that to clinicians. Is that correct? Is that your question? Okay. So um, one of the problems is that we, so some sources curate um, diseases to variants. Um, and, and so we have variant to gene associations that we get from uh, NCBI. Um, we also have some resources that curate phenotypes, phenotypic features to variants or diseases. Um, and so those, so basically using, you know, just the relationship types that we have between those features, actually um, in a little ontology called Gino, which is a little genotype ontology, which helps sort of thinks about the partonomy of, 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 of sort of our um, genetic endowment, our genomic endowment. Um, and, uh, and then also uh, um, working with um, kind of the evidence and provenance models um, we can build those things into uh, different kinds of displays. And different kinds of displays are needed by different kinds of clinical contexts. So for example, in our Eximizer tool, which is our variant prioritization tool, um, we pre-present pre variants to diseases because we the, the goal of that is when a clinician is running a whole exome or whole genome, they want to know, is this, is this variant, variant that's coming up as being potentially pathogenic? Does it have any phenotypic or disease associations that might be associated with it? So we like to show them what we know if there's a variant that is actually associated. Whereas in other cases, like when you first land on the Monarch platform, you, you probably don't want to give somebody a thousand variants on a page, right? So it's just not very navigable that way. So I think it's important that that's where the ontology and the semantic engineering comes in is that you can choose which context um, you know, might make most sense um, in, different, in different contexts. So um, just by flipping a switch, we can kind of go back and forth between phenotypes, diseases, genes, variants, uh, and the like. And I think um, as we get further along, you know, some of the exciting research that we saw yesterday on sort of more of the network biology, also just sort of presenting, you know, clinicians really like to see um, network views. So, you know, this, you know, and we use this in our Eximizer tool as well, but like, protein-protein interactions and, um, you know, uh, um, networks uh, and clusters, basically, 
we see a lot of the common phenotypic features of that same in that same network or that same uh, set of you know enzyme reactions. That's really a strong indication to the clinician that this is really the smoking gun, right? And so they love those kinds of views, um, but it has to be simplified. Like they don't want to see a giant hairball, but if they see like a simple um, chemical reaction or a, a, a small view of a pathway where they see those commonalities, um, that's a really nice uh, visualization for clinicians as well. Other questions? Hi, thank you so much. Uh, I'm curious about kind of where it goes from here and two kind of ways of that. So I work with real world data, clinical trial data and research data, kind of doing back translation. And so I'm wondering, is CDISC uh, a part of the efforts around, so for clinical trial data, kind of leveraging these and then like extending things down. So like a C34 ICD-10 code, the lung cancer, there's lots of subtypes and then even like non-small cell mm -hmm. lung cancer, there's various genomic subtypes that, that we start to find on the research side. And so how do you extend these ontologies? Those are all really great, hard questions. <laughs> um, so for CDISC, I think CDISC is much more uh, of a process set of standards. Um, it doesn't really have all the semantic codings, although it makes some recommendations for them. So I think in terms of like mechanistic discovery, it's just not a very fit for purpose for that, but it is really useful for like, you know, transferring um, STDM files to FDA and things like that um, for trials and just making sure you're meeting regulatory requirements for trials. I think one of the things that's, um, you know, been really challenging is, is how do we, you know, coming back to the CDEs and representing study data, there really isn't a good standard for representing study data. And that's in part one of the things that we're doing with Lincoln ML is trying to come up with sort of a base level model that, you know, you know, like I have like a, more than a dozen ways from different, you know, um, clinical trials and clinical research studies for representing the relationship between a, a patient and a sample. Like, do we really need, they're all the same, right? Like they're not, we don't need to have so many different ways of representing things like that. So could we come up with a base model uh, in using LinkML that would then be, you know, extensible for the different study design types. And then for the enumerations, similar to what I talked about, could we um, kind of reimagine how those CDEs are actually encoded to use ontology, sort of like a, a little semantic library, if you will, of little micro schemas. So study variables are often things like, you know, smoking status isn't just, you know, answers to the question of how many cigarettes you smoke per day, per day. It also has things like, at what age did you start smoking? What's your BMI? What's your sex? There might be some other things. Those are all little variables that are connected in a tiny little micro schema. And so if we could have sort of an upper level link ML model for, you know, not having 12 different ways of representing the relationship between a patient and a sample, and then these little micro schema as libraries that you could just plug in, and the semantics are already taken care of by the ontology enumerations um, and the process for, for encoding those, we might start to get to a better kind of semantically engineered representation for, for clinical research data that really just hasn't existed in any other context. And people say, oh, well, OMOP or FIRE is going to solve the problem, but FIRE is an exchange standard. It doesn't have any declarations about the semantics either, and we are working on that as well. Um, and, and then uh, for OMOP, I think it's increasingly used for uh, study data, but it also was intended for research using, uh, you know, real world data and EHR, EHR real world data. And so it doesn't have, and it, it already has its own mapping issues of mapping everything, uh, you know, to and minting new identifiers. So it's, it's not really designed with that sort of, um, you know, way in which you um, encode and validate uh, the enumerations using the source terminologies in those micro schema contexts and then in a bigger thing. So I think we're, we're still just at the very beginning, but if you would love, I would love to collaborate with you on that because that's really where we're heading. Um, it's, I think it's um, bold vision um, and I'm not sure how well the clinical community is going to look at that um, because, you know, a lot of people think that they're, you know, OMOP or FIRE is going to solve this problem, but both of those have been around for a long time and it's not solving the problem. So I think this is the direction we need to go, but there's a lot of nuances that we haven't really thought through. 